welcome and thanks for uh, moving right into this next session. Um, it's actually kind of a perfect segue from this discussion of digital that was raised in the last uh, panel because I have with me Chris Michaels. He's the head of digital and publishing at the British Museum. And clearly, sort of the digital aspect of art and the museum world has become even more salient in this sort of technological age. And I think a lot of museums are grappling with this um, worldwide. And um, I've actually, um, in my capacity as a culture reporter at the Times, uh, recently covered, for example, some s by budget struggles at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And, and part of what they had to trim back was their um, sort of digital uh, effort. And so it makes me want to start by asking, um, you know, first of all, to just say as an aside, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, and hello to your excellency. <laughs> it's good to be back. Um, just why we need to uh, invest in, in, in digital efforts in a museum, that they, they can kind of seem, it seems counterintuitive when you're dealing with institutions that often have a lot of history. Um, why is it important um, to sort of invest in that direction and, and put efforts and resources? Um, and then also if you can just talk about what the British Museum um, is doing specifically because you are kind of leading the way in a lot of these um, areas. I mean, I think, I think as a simple way of starting that, digital as an activity for museums can only be meaningful if we ask and answer what we think that activity is for. Um, when I was doing my interviews at the British Museum uh, four years ago now, Neil McGregor, our, our then director, asked, I asked him, what do you want me to achieve with this? Uh, and kind of in digital, you can do two things. You can say on one side, well, I can build audience. I can get to as many people as I can with the message that we carry. Or on the other side, I can try and make money. Uh, and Neil, in the brilliantly kind of simple way he answers some questions, well, I, I want you to do both. And that, for me, is the beginning point for digital in museums, is that we have a dual responsibility. In an ever more globalizing age, the ability to carry our message to a global audience is an incredibly important one, and that requires investment both of time, of skill, and of, and of money to do that. But we also have a responsibility to try and drive income streams on behalf of our museums. It's no mistake that digital is a way of making money for museums. 30, 40, 50% of all the sales transactions we will make now are from e-commerce. And that doesn't just happen by magic, it happens by method. And so we have to understand always at the same time, how are we thinking about talking to and with our audience to build audience scale? And how are we thinking to, to capitalize on that in the, the economic revenue generation that we have to do for prosperity? And, and as people like the Met exactly demonstrate some of the challenges that museums are now facing. When you talk about e-commerce, can you give examples of what you mean and how is that not sort of corrupt, corrupting what a museum's mission actually is, which would not usually seem to be to, 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 to generate revenue? Uh, I would say, I, I, again, taking the point about the, the historical evolution of these things, at least since the 70s and the Met in the way is, a, is the beginning of this process, one part of what a museum does is about thinking about audiences as a customer. Back in the 1750s when the BM was founded, we, we were there to serve audiences as citizens as part of the development of the nation state. And that's still the founding reason why museums are created. But at least as far back as the Met staging the Tutankhamun exhibition back in the 70s, we have been thinking ever more about the retail opportunity and the commercial opportunity to drive income streams that are no longer happening from other sources. The British Museum is only 30 or 40% funded by the government. That funding stream worldwide from, from uh, non-commercial sources is continuing to go down. And so if we want to continue to serve our audience by the amazing programs that we can run, we have to find ways to bring that money in and sales and selling things in a very simplistic way is the only way that often you can do that. So is that British Museum scarves and calendars and mugs? The British Museum rubber duck is one of the great items of merchandise in the world. <laughs> Uh, you can have a Viking rubber duck, you can have an Egyptian pharaoh rubber duck, and for every <laughs> temporary exhibition, we will find a rubber duck, generally, that matches the theme of that exhibition. <laughs> I don't think that's demeaning to the audience or to the meaning of the museum. Uh, the simple act of, we are a museum that shows culture in its manifestations throughout history. 
and this is a thing, an object that people take away that is their, their kind of physical totemic memory of what they've done. And so there's nothing wrong with that. It's part of the world that we live in. And so, but we have to do that to continue to fund the things that we do as an organization. Has there been a sort of internal debate around that? Any people who sort of are sort of purists who feel that this is sort of a direction that's gone too far? I don't think it's a new thing by now. I think, I'm sure, again, go back 30, 40, 50 years uh, to the founding of some of the commercial organizations that museums run, you would have had that conversation. Of course, in the purest curatorial spirit of what we want to do, there will always be some discomfort about uh, commercial endeavor. And there should be, because we are founded on enlightenment goals that are about the global free sharing of knowledge. The fact that we can continue to let six and a half million people come for free to the British Museum of View is intensely important with us. We could not and never would be able to do that if we did not have some sustaining commercial revenue activity around it. What about this question of you know, whether or not a digital experience could become a surrogate for a, an actual experiential one? And is that a fear? And how do you drive attendance with kind of a digital um, interaction? I think. I mean, this, this, this kind of argument, and this is one of the founding ideas of this session, this notion that somehow digital is uh, substitutional for a museum experience is ab absolutely nonsensical. And the notion that it would diminish the scale of audience has been utterly disproven over the last 15 years. You are looking at one of the great times in history for museum attendance worldwide. From 2000 to 2015, British Museum attendance rose from 4 million people to 6.7 million people. Of course, in some part, that's due to the brilliance of Neil McGregor as director and the things that we do, but there is no question that the internet as a means of accessing what we do to a global audience that doesn't always have the cultural embeddedness of understanding in the things that we hold to answer it, it is only helpful. Of course, global tourism and those other defining factors bring those through together, but there is no case to be made now that digital is destroying a museum experience. It is only a benefit towards it. What about um, in terms of just um, digital, digitizing the, con the collection? Has yeah. That has happened, and, and, and do you have a sense of who's using it? Is it mostly for research, or is general public, what is the if, if value? If by what we mean about digitizing collections, we mean the presentation of metadata and the presentation of primarily of photography and research materials onto the, uh, the internet. That is really a thing that is primarily for research audiences. Now, a researcher can take two forms. There's the academic researcher using it for professional research, and there is a category of people that we, we still have a relatively dim understanding of who are using this material for personal research, for that kind of general self-educational goal. You can see that that only scales so far. Uh, if you look at kind of st uh, statistics of the most used uh, kind of museum and library websites in the world, Met's number one, American uh, Museum of Natural History is number two, we're number three. We get about a million people a month, the Met's at about two million people a month, uh, American Museum of Natural History is about one and a half. On your website, this yeah. is? Mm -hmm. At that kind of scale level, even the biggest uh, library website in the world, the Bibliothèque Nationale in France, is five million people a month. This isn't the whole world looking at digitized collections, it is a, a, a particular population that needs to use that material. Because, and I speak frankly, sometimes when you have a record for a coin from the third century BC, the things that you can say about it are not very interesting to a general population, nor should they be. It's the narratives that you weave at a more macro scale which tell stories that are interesting. Individual objects are part of a very rich, large fabric, but knowing about them individually is something that, again, is a, for a particular need in a particular circumstance. A lot of what I hear in the museum world is trying to sort of demystify the museum experience. Mm -hmm. There is a, a still a sense of intimidation some visitors feel about climbing the steps, about whether they need to know something before they come in the doors. Yeah. To what extent is digital kind of providing an antidote to that and trying to make museums more accessible? How are you actually doing that as specifically as you can be about yeah, that well, strategy? Well, I would, in a way, I would think the other way around. And I, I, when I talk about digital transformation, I think you have to, to understand that generally digital transformation is, whoever you are, is something that happens to you and then you respond to it rather than something you drive. The digital transformation of the museum is driven by the audience that comes in with a mobile phone in their hand that uses that mobile phone to consistently, constantly share social media experiences with their audience as they go through the museum. 90% of all the usage of our Wi-Fi service, which about a million people a year use, is sharing things on Facebook, on Instagram, on WhatsApp. So that is the, the mass scale digital experience of museums, which the world is experiencing. 
Our job is to intermediate in that and find ways to kind of intervene in that experience so that meaning is held. Because every, every member of that global audience is saying something slightly different to their audience about what we mean. So for us, it's about getting into that social media stream with content that is as meaningful as possible that adds to the dialogue around it. Over the last two years, the core driver of that change has been the amazing power of video in social media. When I started the, at the BM, there was no video on Facebook, there was no video on Twitter, there was no video on Instagram. In the time since I've been there, we've gone from a million videos being watched on Facebook, on YouTube over about four or five years, very tiny amounts of numbers. Hosted by visitors or you? Hosted by us. To now the video programs that we run, which is about 150 videos in the last year and a half, uh, a million video views a month. Facebook Lives, Periscopes, this constant sense of telling the story outwardly of the particular things in the, the collection, the particular experience of the museum, that has been a phenomenal way to open up that museum experience, both to visitors as they come in, so that they understand through the kind of uh, the digital experience of what, uh, uh, that they're, what they're going to get, but to the audience that never comes. Some of the most revelatory moments I've seen in terms of audience experience, which I've been at the MR, when we stage very simple things like Facebook Live walkthroughs of our Egyptian sculpture gallery. And we stage it in a way so that you're, you know, we're going to get to the Rosetta Stone last, and you don't see it till you just about get to it. But as you wander through, you get this constant uh, flow of comment from the audience that comes along. And these kind of explosions of joy as people then see objects that some of them will never see physically in their own lives, I think is an intensely powerful thing. The other piece it opens up is the opportunity for that audience at scale to have mass dialogue with curators. Any of us who work in museums know the greatest joy in museum experiences is when a curator who really knows what they're talking about takes you through and tells you the story of something, talking in your ear about it. Facebook Live, probably more than any other thing we've ever had as museums, is the way for that dialogue from curator to audience to happen at scale for tens of thousands of people to be able to ask questions to the expert. And we said, we've, we've seen that, we're seeing that as a fairly revelatory experience in how museums can run, that we no longer need the, the participation partnership always of the great TV companies and publishers who we work with so well. We can let our curators talk with them directly, one-on-one, -on -one, once, twice a week. And it's an I think it's been an amazing thing for us. We've actually been trying Facebook Live at the New York Times somewhat, and it seems somewhat analogous in that you know, when I've done them, let's say, walk through the Agnes Martin show at the Guggenheim, yeah. you get thousands of views, but we still don't know, are those gonna, people going to become subscribers? Are they going yeah. It's going to drive traffic to the Times website. Are these going to become readers? And I would imagine that's a question for you. Are these people who are going to return in person, are they going to become members? Are they going to kind of benefit yeah. your bottom line? I, I think there's a the question for us here of thinking about audiences in slightly different ways from this. Clearly, the commercial imperative needs to pertain, but when you think of a digital audience, you need to think of it almost as a different category of person um, from the rest of your audiences. A member who comes and pays you 60 pounds a year might be someone who only ever watches one video on your website, or they might be someone who watches <laughs> tens of thousands of videos on your website, but they're different in their constitution at that point. We have to understand, measure, learn from the digital personas of our audiences see them as a kind of congregation of data from lots of different sources and talk to that digital person slightly different from the human being who sits alongside it. We can't assume always that there will be a conversion point from digital audience member here to none to kind of human being giving us money here. That's not quite the way of it. But the person who likes and reshares thousands of videos that we put on Facebook has a very specific value for us that will lead into that value chain. So we just have to, I think we have to sit, think of them separately and then start to understand them in a different way, not as a kind of direct funnel from one thing into another. Questions from the audience? Your Excellency. I think that's an area where we failed in personally at the Qatar Museums in terms of putting our collections online, or although we've been trying to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've got part of our collection, but there's a lot more that's in stories that we would like to 
uh, make accessible. You mentioned the idea of something, the, your method is actually studied and it's not magically up there. I'd like to know more about your methodology. How do you come across that and how do you measure whether what you're trying to achieve is actually a success or not? Um, for us, as we think about the collection, first of all, our, our measure for digitization of the collection is when can we finish digitizing all of it? Uh, we have 8 million objects in our collection. It's a phenomenally large, detailed, complex collection of things. Uh, we are about halfway through that process of digitization. 4 million objects have metadata around them. 2 million objects have photos. Hundreds, and only hundreds now, have 3D scans. Uh, hundreds have videos around them. Hopefully, by 2020-ish, we get to the end of completing digitization. Uh, but that process is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge or something like that. The, the, it will never end as a cycle because it, once knowledge is created, it always needs to be adapted and changed. So your first measure, I'd say, is completion of get all of it done. The second piece is then how you're building cycles of work to review and refresh it. Because we have very complex things in our collections coins or objects that come from countries where the boundaries and uh, the boundaries of that country moved and suddenly it comes from one a different country from the one it comes from before and of course that has in intense cultural sensitivities around it so we have to make sure not just that the facts are right but also that our understanding of those objects continues to grow and develop so that we can reflect the world these objects came from but also the world that we live in what about social media are you guys doing that or <laughs> the, the, I mean, the only counsel I would give to everyone doing social media through museums is ev everyone starts the same way. Uh, they post a, photo, a picture of one of the things in their collection, they talk about that object, and then the next day they'll promote their exhibitions. And that's like your basic founding program. So you collection stuff here, marketing stuff here. Ultimately, this, the power of, sto of social media is about editorial storytelling. You know, there are amazing lessons to learn from people at like the Times here about how you tell stories to an audience there. They don't just want the thing and they don't just want the marketing. They want the narrative around it. And whether it's the amazing things the Times do or whether it's, you know, Humans of New York and these other great examples, learning to tell intense, meaningful stories in social media, that's how you will get to scale. The other th obvious thing to say about social media is you kind of have to play the game of those organizations. Uh, Facebook, you get growth by doing 360-degree videos, by doing Facebook Live. You're, you're in a kind of constant dance with the algorithm. The algorithm will always win, uh, so you have to kind of keep re-dancing, learning new dance moves all the time to keep up with it. Uh, that's not just a problem for museums, that's a problem for the whole world. Uh, but How many followers on Facebook? Uh, 1.3 million and counting. So own the Met is above us, the Louvre is above us. Our goal, my goal for my guys is to supersede uh, those organizations. And what would you post on Instagram, for example? Uh, Instagram is, uh, is about beauty. I mean, that's the real power of Instagram. It's unlocked a, a new aesthetics of beauty and, and photography. And so really beautiful object-based stories becomes meaningful there. Facebook, Twitter, it's kind of scrappier and scruffier somehow. But Instagram is about aesthetic quality. And it's just, I said, you have to understand each channel differently. There is, unfortunately, no solution where you can just post the same stuff across 10 social media channels. Everyone needs to be curated meaningfully, thoughtfully, and understood for what it is. And that's, for big organizations like us, that's a challenge. For smaller organizations, it's possibly, you know, there's, a, there's the boundaries of possibility around it, but it will only work if you play it that way around. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Hello. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about IP rights uh, on social media, yeah. Creative Commons, and so on, and if you deal with them. Uh, we, I, uh, I've, I've said many times, I think intellectual property is the biggest challenge to the museum sector, not because of the complexity of it, and it is a complex area, but because it has been ignored in many ways for many centuries now. Uh, when I came to the BM, I'm not, I'm not, I'm still not, I still don't qualify myself as a museum's person because I've only been there three years. Uh, the first thing I realized I had to do was to found a specific IP and rights team to start to model out the, the, the compl that complexity of digital IP 
in a proper professional methodical way and to start to document it. And it is intensely complicated. If you just think what happens when you post a photograph on Facebook, at the moment, any of you who've now posted a photograph from this room this morning on Facebook have granted Facebook an in perpetuity, non-exclusive ex non right to use that photo basically however the hell they want forever. And that's fine when you're in a, a, a public space where there's no complexity around that, but when you have objects from uh, ethnographic collections, as, a, as an easy example, uh, that come from places where they don't want their content because of its very particular personal, social, and collective value posted on the internet, you run into tension points. So there's, a, there's real thought that needs to go into that process. Alongside that, the question of open data sharing is one that has not quite been resolved yet in any museum sector in the world. We see great initiatives like the Mets one recently, the Rex Museum is famous examples, but they're unresolved tensions. Because, again, coming back to the first question, because about the challenge between here we're trying to build audience and here we need to know we need, know we need to make money from that audience. I can't take away my commercial licensing business for the images for the museum because it contributes real money back that pays real people's wages despite the fact that I understand utterly why people would want to give all the way all those photos to everybody in the whole world. And that's a tension that just is, is ongoing as we, as we fight this continuous battle. Okay, others, yes. Um, two small remarks, first of all. Um, your topic was the Future Museum. <laughs> yeah. Um, first, um, on the Future Museum, what we are trying to do, maybe do the same in the British Museum, what we are trying to do in the is we have in the collection, so where you are in front of the artwork, we have a screen there, and if you are now interested in to, more about, to learn more about the object in front of you, you can go different layers. From the, if you want from the child or the student until the art professor, until the journalist, you can immediately, next to the art object, you're there, and you have the additional information ready-made. So I just wonder if you do this as, as well. Second of all, this year we have Documento 14 in Kassel. Um, is, it, is it essential for museums of the world getting together I think Documenta Castle for me, I've been there three times, it's a wonderful experience. Is this a meeting place where museums exchange where they are, where they are traveling through, where the future museum is, or do you not need anything like that anymore? I mean, to take the first, the first part of the question, um, I, uh, David Chipperfield is speaking over the course of the next couple of days, and one of the most revelatory moments for me in my journey at the British Museum is when David Chipperfield spoke about his concerns about introducing more digital media into galleries. And actually, I've become very, in a very peculiar way, one of the least, the, the, the most reticent advocates of putting digital experiences into the museum. And I say that because you already have an audience that's bringing their digital experience with them. And so to double intermediate with digital risk, I think, very much the, the potential for the phenomenological experience of contact with objects. Uh, Neil McGregor says it very beautifully that you, in museums you learn through looking. And if that learning through looking is, is double mediated by object and then digital uh, interpretation beside it, you risk the power of distraction. That that encounter with the object goes away uh, and that you then you disappear into the thing next to it. But what about, that, can you take a tour with your phone? Uh, we, uh, we focus very much on our audio guide business, coming back to your commercial question, because we think it's the best way for us to service the needs of our audience at scale. We will unpack that into, uh, into kind of bring your own device-based models. But again, it's about structure of the experience for me. It's, and again, I always am worried about bringing that more media inside the galleries themselves. In terms of how museums of the world share that knowledge together, I, mean, I, I don't know the specific event you, you're talking about, but all opportunities to talk are good opportunities. There is, because many organizations now are thinking much more on a global scale basis, how you interact on a global scale basis, of course, is, a, is an important thing. But I, I can't speak particularly on the, the event you talk about. Okay, one last question. Yes, in the back. Uh, Anno Cellier, New York Times, Art Representative Paris. You mentioned uh, Facebook to be in touch with uh, different kind of audience, but what about Snapchat? Uh, do you have any <laughs> project? Uh, we, uh, we have a, a project about Snapchat, which is to have endless discussions about it and do nothing. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think, honestly, with Snapchat, it, it, all of social media is about the personalization of narrative one way or another. There is no, I cannot see a successful way that any brand talks about itself to a Snapchat audience. 
that I, I had a dream of getting a young curator to sort of live their life through Snapchat and that to be our advocacy tool. Of course, every young curator I asked said, absolutely not. <laughs> I am not ruining my career doing this for you. So <laughs> we, uh, we have not found that model. Uh, but that remain, that's the next generational challenge is the next generations of uh, dialogue in social are ones we have not even really begun to encounter yet. And Snapchat's the e in a way the easiest. Worry more about WhatsApp. Worry more about Kick and these kind of uh, the black social network channels where you cannot see what happens inside them. That's the next challenge for us to take on and to really understand. Farah is up next. Thank you to Chris. Thank you, Thank you all.